Good tidings, all you beautiful individuals. The wait is finally over, not just here at League Unlocked, but MSI as a whole. We got day one action, and not just day one action, but marquee matchups. Iconic players hitting the rift right away at MSI 2024. Day one plans and we're gonna get to see t1 faker in action at msi this is something we haven't ever seen before yes day one msi rolling on through t1 fly quest hitting the rift psg astral we got the good matchups coming on through for you hot and fresh this is your msi recap and maybe Always the first matches, especially for NA teams, seem the most tense because I feel like people are ready to call the LCS tournament over quicker than any other region when they drop a game. And it was absolute classic vintage North America in this first game because things look like they're going pretty well. Masu on Jinx is mega fed. They're controlling around the map. They grab a Baron. Things are looking good. And then they just kind of get out team fought by PSG two, three times in a row. And the consequences of getting out team fought by PSG two or three times in a row at that point for FlyQuest was handing over the balance and the scales of the game. Because all of a sudden, the scaling aspect of PSG's composition really turned online and you know what turned online senna hitting you from a whole different screen away just clicking on you from the safety of another country feeling like it was something in this one yes that's how this game one goes at that point psg picks up that advantage from those two team two three team fights find their way to fight through get that advantage and then from then on they have the edge every single time flyquest isn't able to get the proper setups for any of these later objectives and it is all about psg making it through and crushing FlyQuest in this first game. And you know what? You're right. A lot of people waiting for that early domino to drop for a region like North America. Near airport, right, of course, as everyone's talking about. You're starting to think the panic button right away for FlyQuest. I'm here to calm those fears because game two, your boy's FlyQuest, your boy Masu down in the bottom lane showed up big time. I feel like NA fans are just hovering the panic button to start the tournament at these international events. But yeah, Betty ended up doing 20k more damage than anyone else in the game uh, in that first game on Senna. But you're right, the bounce back comes in for game two. It's another solid early start for Masu and the bot lane. Lucian Nami in that second one. He gets to take over some of these team fights. And by the time PSG is finally able to get to him and take him out of fights, well... There's a double-digit kill approaching Urgot to clean up these fights. That was the problem. Early it is, a couple advantages going the way of PSG, but it is that bottom lane. It is Masu and Busio finding that angle, finding that 2v2, and getting some pressure, getting some kills on the board for the FlyQuest squad. And he said, later on, of course, you're trying to deal with this Lucian. Nami, they're doing so much damage, you get to him. That's the objective accomplished. We can do it. Oh, wait a minute, we have a bigger threat. And yes, that is the Bwipo Urgot. What about the combination? Throwing in inspired Maokai onto it. You know, not necessarily the champion combination that we are always talking about with him, but it's set up and followed through on a lot of these things for the rest of FlyQuest excellently in this matchup. Yeah, the, the split push TP flanks out of Whippo and Urgot. Those are always strong points that he has as a player, but definitely highlighted in game two. They still have a little bit of a flip Baron that they end up giving over to Junjia, but again, that's another fight that Whippo cleans up on Urgot. So still a little bit messy, but a solid bounce back in the second game for FlyQuest. Absolutely. When you want to tighten down the screws, certainly looking back on it, but what's a, what's a North America victory without a good old burger flip at Baron? <laughs> that's... That's their recipe to success and failure. It, it both goes the same way. So we get that decisive game three. It's another tank game. Uh, Sejuani again for Inspired, but he was all over the map. He was all over the map this entire series. His ultimates were on point, and it's another solid performance out of Masu. Uh, he's looking only three games, but he's looking much more confident than he was even in the playoffs for FlyQuest. Masu is big, and this is the step up that you are absolutely thrilled to see if you are a FlyQuest fan at this point, a North American fan, North American copium, hopium believer, whatever you want to call it, seeing Masu step up like this, 
necessary if FlyQuest is going to have any chance of hanging around at this event and even have a chance of doing damage to some of these teams that you don't think that they have the edge against, that they will be underdogs in their matchups. This one, even against PSG, maybe you give them that slight edge heading into it, but you still could find angles for the loss. They come through strong, specifically this game three. And with Masu, games two and three, backing it up with the firepower. And heck, I'm gonna throw Jensen on that Oriana. Come on, PSG. How do you let your boy Jensen get the Oriana? Not like this is a brand new secret coming through from this veteran Jensen getting a great performance in game three as well. FlyQuest closing the door and moving on. Yeah, he gets kind of the, not kind of, finally the nail in the coffin in this one, grabbing a quadra kill and is the only guy alive to TP and close things out. 75% win rate career on Oriana. So pretty nasty numbers out of Jensen. And that head to head in game three was the biggest mismatch of the entire series because that karma mid out of Maple might as well not have been in the game. Yeah, it's it's something that needs to be talked about, I think, because as much as we love Maple and, of course, the story and legacy of his career is a real thing to acknowledge and, and you know, measure when you're talking about this player. We do got to look at the more recent performances because certainly he has stepped up domestically for PSG, but you look at the international scene, it has been a little bit messy. It's been a little bit turbulent because you can go back to last year and go to that BDS series. And yes, there's a lot of individual mistakes where Maple is the one causing it or not getting that execution properly. You go to this series with FlyQuest. And I think outside of that first game, outside of that Azir performance, it was a very middle of the road to negative performance from Maple in this series for PSG. Really one where I think he got outplayed quite a lot by his equal veteran in Jensen. And of course, still the utmost leader of FlyQuest uh, inspired. Crazy stat from this series. Across all three games, there were only four kills that Inspired did not contribute to. So the entire game plan, early, mid, and late, was running through the man in the jungle. Even running through on those tankier picks, on those options that are more so enabling the rest of the squad to get going as opposed to being that tip of the spear that is that Sharpie point that he can be inspired. This is a good sign from him for the rest of the squad. I can't wait to see if we can continue this type of form from him as we move into more carry oriented picks. One note of improvement is definitely Busio on the Nautilus in this series. Uh, some suspect hooks and definitely not his best performance on the day. Hey, you know, that. Hey, I'm just going to blame that one on the travel. That's the jet lag on a couple of these uh, choices, a couple of these flashes into the wall. Uh, some some ugly looks for your boy Everyone Busio. else was flying first class. They didn't have enough tickets for him, so he didn't sleep well on coach, you know. <laughs> I got full faith that we are going to see that bounce back from him and at least the very most important part of that bottle lane, getting Masu to see him performing early like this at an MSI event. Good signs for flight quest. Obviously still very early in the tourney. PSG goes down to losers. FlyQuest advances onward to that winner's upper round uh, for qualification. Matching up against the winner of T1 versus Astral Esports. Obviously, probably the biggest mismatch uh, matchup-wise in terms of the first round of action in MSI. But credit where credit is due. From the very get-go... The Latam champions, we're here to play and to at least make T1 work on the day. Oh man, 25 minute games at the very minimum here from Estral. I don't think a lot of people we were We thought expecting. they might be under 20. I think a lot of people were in that boat as well, thinking it would be that sub 20 minute matches. Goes a little bit longer. Yes, I think you can look at T1's effort and, and amount of focus and lock in for this game and maybe realize, you know, of course, in contrast to the last time we saw T1 out was that LCK finals against Gen G going the full distance. Obviously a little bit different of that lock and of that focus for this type of game. You do see enough of it though, and enough of that effort that you do have to credit to the side of Estral for how long we stayed into some of these matches. How about your man, Jose Diodo? I think he had a very good series overall, even in that first game where the, the scoreline isn't quite as much of a standout compared to game two. He's uh, he's trying to audition to get a spot back in the LCS maybe because my man's probably at that caliber you were seeing. Yeah, especially the Lee Sin in that second game. But hey, credits 
to Zopve for picking number one, Ione, right away to match up against Zeus, the king of the top lane, uh, who's just sitting on Cassante duty this series. By the way, the end of game one, seeing this Draven oh. hit Cassante, he's at sub 10%, and he gets like six auto attacks and doesn't even move his health bar. Uh, look, hold on to your Draven stocks, please. If you were any buyers, as we told you about the Draven buffs coming through, the Draven players we've got at this event still hold faith. I think this Draven pick is absolutely going to be a power pick, a power bully in the bottom lane. He was absolutely no bully. He was he was getting wedgies from your boy Cassante in this game. Uh, tough luck for for the champ. But yeah, there's. There's still going to be plenty, plenty of Draven presence throughout this event. Uh, as we go into game two, we get the first lane swap action of MSI. And this was, uh, I don't want to call it vintage, but classic lately Zeus action. Because obviously he seems to not have as much experience with the lane swap. How many times are we going to see top laners die, immediately TP in back to the turret and die again? Uh, I'm going to put it at least twice, at least twice more at this event. You can put it up and you can probably put Zeus in for one of those twice, two more times that are going to come through <laughs> at this event. Yeah, it is a rough look. I, I, I'm actually kind of surprised we didn't see more of these lane swaps come through earlier with that FlyQuest series, not necessarily looking at both the teams and saying, oh yeah, it's going to be a feeling that was going to be the momentum for this event. Seeing it, you know, dabbled with here in the T1 series. And it felt like Zothfe was playing it so well early. He gets a first blood on the Faker, then he runs to the bot lane, and they get a couple kills on Zeus. He seems set up for success. And then all of a sudden, you look a little bit later, he's got eight CS, he's getting dove, and then he's three levels behind Zeus for most of this game. But it doesn't matter because he still somehow gets a solo kill on him. I, that I do not understand how that sequence of events rolls on through like that because yes, he is absolutely trying all sorts of things. None of it really finding too much success. At least he's trying and then you see, well, that's the consequence of trying something like that is those CS results at that point. And then he, he says it doesn't matter because I'm still able to pull off the kill against cities. That is quite the trip. He still is, you know, down sizable amounts for the whole game. Yes. Faker quietly is up 50 CS. Both solo laners were two to three levels up for the majority of this game. But Astral, we're still going toe to toe, finding picks, finding avenues to stay in it, not let the gold lead balloon too far. But eventually, this one was mostly for me about Kyria's rumble, running around, cooking everybody up. And then owner on the Viego gets denied a pentakill by Kyria. But how many times are we going to see owner pop off on Viego at MSI? I want to see it at least one more time. Give me that again, man. He was he was really clean on that Viego that you're mentioning. And really, the thing that I think overall at the end of the day when I come out of this series is that I appreciate Astral, number one, as you mentioned, some of these draft picks, taking that aggression, taking that confidence to not back down in, in a turtle shell against a T1, against a higher region type situation. And then, yes, it is the rest of T1 and, you know, certainly not having that focus to the same type of degree as i was talking about in the lck finals understandable of course and all these type of things but seeing just the type of execution here at this point from this point on in that game too talking about owner talking about kiria that is where you can feel that comfort zone for t1 at this event early and it really does feel like a lot of the time owner is kind of the x factor for t1 when they're playing at their very best you're talking about Owner being one of the best junglers at whatever tournament he's in. When Owner is slumping is usually when we're feeling a little bit shaky about T1. It kind of feels like he's this crucial catalyst for a lot of the positive things that we talk about with T1. A lot of the things that happen start with or have some type of connection to Owner being on top of things, being able to put and input his will out onto Summoner's Rift, out onto the enemy team. When that isn't the case, yes, it is a bit of a disruption. It is a tougher angle to get some of these systems online for T1 to start operating as the juggernaut we know they can be out there on the rift. So it's still an 0-2 loss for Astral Esports, but honestly, if they play to this level or similar, I like their odds in that loser's matchup against PSG. 
I think that that one is is no doubt going the full distance as well down in that loser's bracket. And yes, it is going to be a brawl if Astral is able to play at this same type of level. Because if PSG, again, I think is getting a little bit of a knockdown in a lot of people's eyes due to that performance against FlyQuest, you can maybe expect a little bit of a bounce back, hope, if you're still on that hopium for them in this loser's bracket. But Astral, they certainly showed us more than enough against the T1 that you got to give them that edge in that loser's bracket, which is still crazy to me. And I mean, especially when you look at, you know, Maple in that game three, not quite the level. Cody had a decent series considering he's matching up against the GOAT. So there's there's definitely angles where you're writing uh, the LLA getting a rematch potentially or a match against FlyQuest, obviously, whoever loses in the winner's side. Even Junjia, right, in the jungle for uh, PSG, I think wasn't as strong, made a couple of whoopsies and mistakes, uh, you know, all the way through that series. Jose Diodo was sharp. He was on it, and he was absolutely, even the way, you know, things were going and being that T1 leaning side, he was able to find plays for the side of Astral. Got to be looking at him in that edge in the jungle for that ma next matchup. Before we actually got to the games on the Rift, obviously, always got to have the hype up teaser video at these international events. And I don't know, man, going back to like 2021 Worlds, 2022 Worlds, let's say, the teaser seemed to be at another level. This one fully, I mean, you got five plus minutes. Usually these are like a minute and a half for the playing stage, but the LPL and Riot going all out. Obviously, China heavily referenced when it's uh, a home type of tournament but uh, overall especially the mako faker storyline this this feels like worlds not msi uh, yeah look okay, let's be let's be honest a little more than just a little for the lpo in that one absolutely uh playing to the hometown crowd and nothing wrong We're with that Uzi one. highlights at this event huh Are you it's kind of you know rng was a little bit of a stretch at that point talking about it going yeah, but where is our they're not at this event whatsoever type of thing it was awesome, man. Getting a full five minute teaser like that, it really felt like something that you'd get, you know, from the NBA on TNT or something for the finals type of situation for them. The type of production, absolutely happy to see that one coming through for MSI. And it, it stands in incredible contrast to, I think, the lead up, the lead in to MSI when you're looking at it and understanding, yes, not as long as previous years. And we've talked so much about how that's a positive and how much we like that understanding makes it more difficult to have some of these prepared segments, prepared things to go and roll through, especially the amount of production that has to go in to one of these type of teasers to do it to the quality that this one was understandable. That tough turnaround didn't really have a lot of things going on. We don't have an MSI theme song or anything else around this year that we've had in various other years. I know that get lost in when you look in the retrospective, especially in comparison to the world songs that we do get later. This is at least a good little sign for MSI, and it was a good treat and good one, I think, for any fan to go check in and get your get your blood po boiling and pump it and get ready for some MSI action. I mean, it's pretty easy for them to find a theme or storyline when you have Mako and Faker both in this play-in stage, met in the finals way back at the first MSI event. It's been the LPL's tournament to run, so they didn't have to look very hard anytime they can they said we get faker in the plan teaser okay yeah, it's an extra bonus for riot at that point getting faker in there but they got a couple of other players uh you know of course featuring them and everything else this was good and I'm, you know what i'm also feeling i like kind of the theming around the broadcast and the visuals and everything else that they've got for msi this year feels like a fresh representation of what we've got compared to looking at some of the old msi stages and, and setups and most importantly, it feels like a fresh new event should feel like an international event, not just another domestic final. So, so far, uh, A-OK -okay in that regard. Looking ahead, day two action. Do any of the results from day one really change how we're feeling? We start, you know, top esports versus loud, the bigger mismatch, and the guys from the CBL all saying they just they just want more respect for Brazil. And if you're competitive even against TES... Respect's going to be there. We just talked about Astral, 20 minutes, expectations against T1, beating it to the 25 in both of those matches, even 27, really. And the second one is the same for Loud in this situation, I think, against top esports at this point. I'm calling for it. I want to see the Jackie Love Draven. Give it to me. Give it to me right now. I know for Loud fans, you don't want to see any of that action brought into Summoning Circle. 
but I'm, I want to see it. I need to see this champion get a little bit of redemption compared to what how it was doing against uh, Zeus's Cassante today. I need to see it. I'm worried for Robo in this series. We just saw Zoth Fei, who's a bit of a chirpy top laner, get humbled a little bit. Robo might get some of that same medicine against 369. I think that is absolutely a guarantee. You can dial that one up in this matchup the way through 369 has been performing and been at that top level for this top esports team. I think the other thing to look at here is going to be your boy Tenones in the mid lane. I think that if he can bring some of that veteran savvy, some of that knowledge to the mid lane, and take it up against your boy Cream. I think that this is going to be uh, an area that you can find it against top esports. Other matchup, uh, usually Gam going against a major region. You're worried about succumbing to the chaos and the madness of the VCS. But Fnatic is the craziest team in the LEC. Their games are almost never clean. So this series is probably right up their alley. And, and uh, there's so much of me. Again, I've been such a homer for, you know, uh, banging on for the VCS all these times, Gigabyte Marines and getting a lot of, unfortunately, not quite the payback that a lot of us want to see at these international events. Heading into this one against Fnatic, I think obviously the expectation a little bit different with the whole substitution situation. But I, I think that this one is going to be all about that bottom. Noah and Jun are going to be the big pop off. They are going to be that edge of darkness for Fnatic to make sure that it is them coming through at the Nexus. Much like we saw T1 lane swap against the Straw, I feel like TES is going to lane swap almost just as like they're practicing scrims out there to see how the strat works. <laughs> oh, if it just yeah, just feeling it out, you know, putting a couple feelers out there to test 369, it. how do you feel about having 8 CS at 10 minutes? Feel good about that? I don't think he's going to be a mega fan about it, but hey, you know what? If we if he starts seeing Jackie Love on Draven... With a mega CS advantage, maybe he is going to be okay with something like that. Lane swaps are definitely the thing to be keeping a track of throughout this event. Which teams are doing it, how it evolves, that might be the biggest meta shaper, even more so uh, than what champions are being picked. But only one day in the books. We're full steam ahead at MSI 2024. That is it today, though, for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.